Hello, you're listening to Mike Madden on the Art Show Podcast. Here you'll find interviews with authors, musicians, artists and anyone else in and around the arts. Some of the interviews are taken direct from the Art Show on Expat Radio, with one or two specials in between. This show features Simon Mark Smith, who has an unusual way of creating music. Due to the disability of having no lower arms, he relies entirely on computers. Hello, this is Mike Madden on the Art Show on Expat Radio, and tonight I've got a very special guest who is uh, unusual in that he's a musician, or is he? he? He claims that he's not a musician, but he certainly plays music, so let's hear all about our latest guest, Simon Mark Smith. Welcome to the show, Simon. Hi, Mike. Thank you. Um, now, uh, it, uh, an intriguing introduction, and uh, you're not musically trained and you can't play any instruments, but you do play a considerable variety of songs. So just explain how you create your music. Okay. Well, I, I, um, I was born with no lower arms, and uh, um, a friend of mine says the only reason why I can't play any instruments is because I'm, I'm a bit lazy, because there's all these videos online of people with no arms playing pianos and things like that. So I don't know if I can blame my arms for that. But anyway, that's partly why I don't play instruments. But I really was into computers from a very early time, from you know ZX81 back in the 80s. And um, when Atari computers came along, I, started, I realized I could actually make music using them. So... From the early, you know, from the eight, late eighties, I started creating music using computers, but I still relied on musicians to come in and play whatever ideas I came up with properly. And so I could program in; I could just like repeat a, a four-bar loop and like play a note, and if it sounded right, play another note, and so on. So I, I build up my patterns of music doing that, or even draw them in on the screen. So I don't actually play an instrument, but I can create music doing that. But over the last few years, um, there's been kind of developments in software where you're actually getting, you can say to a computer, I want to have a saxophone play this kind of chord in this kind of way. And, and then you can manipulate it around a bit more yourself afterwards. So it really does sound like real music. So uh, I, I hardly ever use real musicians anymore. Right. And this, so this fact was hidden from your uh, Facebook followers, uh, of which you've got quite a number for many years. Yeah. So why have you decided to come out and tell them about it now? I think it's less about me coming out. It's more about me just not hiding it. So it's right, a bit different. Yeah. Rather, I don't want to make a major thing of it because otherwise people can go, isn't it marvellous? I would never really know if I actually like my music or not. So that's why I did it for the last 10 years or so, was just to see how people would react to the music and not my disability. And... Um, Anyway, so so I thought, but it's a bit odd to hide it as well. So, rather, and also because his last album was done with a lot of virtual musicians and computers, I thought that would be interesting to people to hear that. So, I thought I, it kind of had to go a bit hand in hand with not having hands, if you see what I mean. So, yeah, yeah. Um, now you mentioned the eighties, and back in nineteen eighty five, your computer would sit there and blink at you until you gave it. So very detailed instructions what to do, usually through a, a, plop, a floppy disk or, or a diskette or whatever. Um, whereas now it seems that it takes a huge place in the creative process. So how much is just software and how much is actually artificial intelligence that comes comes about from using it? Yeah, well, well, it's kind of an interesting point you're making because I think if I was to say I just push a button and it does all the work, that would really take a lot of credibility away from the music and pe- that would actually affect how people heard it. So, you know, if you look at Michelangelo's work, we do appreciate that, you know, he suffered to make it. So yeah. I think kind of the process does get involved in how we, we criticise a piece of work or appreciate it. Um, I, I, For instance, one of the songs you'll be playing later, hopefully, is um, Dangerous Things. Now, that one, I spent six weeks creating the backing track. So if I'd had musicians there with me, it would have probably taken a couple of days. So it's a lot more work because you're actually having to play every instrument, try, you're, you're basically saying to the computer, play this, and it will play it, just like a musician might play something for you. And you'll say, oh, I like that, or I don't like it. And then, and then you've got to try and find something that fits with it. So computers haven't got to the stage at the moment where they can listen to the music that's already there. Well, I mean, I haven't got a process where we can do this. Listen to the music that's already there and think what might be best to suit it. So I'm still the person saying, I think what might be best here is a saxophone, let's say. And um, so that's that's quite different to it being very automated. But it, it, it is like having a musician there who, who um, you know, will say, what's this sound like? And, yeah, and, yeah. Which, which is quite real. 
So you you uh, you write the songs, uh, you you compose them, and you sing on them as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, but in terms of the actual creation of the song, would you would you class yourself as a musician or more of a producer? I think I think nowadays they use that word and they music producer, which used to mean something else. That used to be all kind of things, isn't it? Like the person who yeah. had the money or the idea or was in charge of everything. Whereas I think now the term music producer is becoming a lot of people now do not play instruments and um and and and, and you, as you can hear when you hear the music but let's not go there anyway and uh and 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 so they turn themselves they call themselves music producers so i'd say yeah i'm a music producer or a composer i definitely compose in the sense where i put things together as is you know, like you're making a composition of something you know, so. yeah now you, you mentioned your album uh, called dangerous things and it's a, a mix of rock pop uh folk songs there's all kinds of stuff in there and you also mentioned the importance of songs being accessible or, or otherwise they could fall by the wayside and, and in a sort of a disposable society there's always a song that uh you know you don't like it initially but it, it then grows on you uh, and are, are you sort of in that in that space where your songs you need to listen to them several times do you think people could just grasp them and, and go with them I think I've done a mixture on that album because one of my um, friends, he, he, he took the album and, we, he, and he, he, he said he'd been having it in the car and he said there was quite a few songs at first. He just thought, oh, yeah, so what kind of thing? And after some time, they've actually become growers to him. And and I think that's the trouble at the moment with the music world. I mean, the way music's going now is you're going to get a lot more exposure if you put one song out on Spotify than if you put a whole album out. So if you put 10 songs out individually, you'll actually get on loads of playlists. Whereas if you put an album out, you'll get one song from the album album out on the playlist so loads of people are putting one song at a time and of course then they're kind of thinking well will people actually listen to this any more than 10 seconds if they don't like the initial you know if they don't like it and and whereas when we were younger we had albums we had to listen to the whole album because we couldn't be bothered to get up and move the needle across so eventually we started liking music i mean songs we didn't initially like so i think the way we're listening is actually going to affect that kind of, you know, the, the kind of the growers, the songs which we find are growers. And um, so, so I'm, I'm kind of, I'm thoughtful when I'm making an album, putting an album together about having a few tracks at first, let's say, that, that will kind of get people to listen a bit more. And then, um, you know, the other ones I, I put on there for people who are going to listen to it over and over again. So they get hypnotized by it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a good way of putting it because uh, you know the, those those old record players they used to get to the end of the record and then they'd start again automatically. Yeah, which, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and and our cassettes we had auto reverse. Do you remember that? Yes, and I do. Yeah, yeah. It. yeah. It was quite snazzy back then. Yeah, and uh, you know the the other thing with singles back then was they all had a B side as well. So yeah, yeah. Uh, you got two songs for the price of one. Yeah, funny enough, I was looking at Spotify last night and Dire Straits have just put out a song yesterday that they put out years ago in like 2005 or two or earlier than that 90 something and it had two songs on the b-side and one of the songs on the b-side is probably my favorite one of my favorite dire straight songs so the song they put out was heavy fuel i think it's called and um and the b-side one of the songs on the b-side was planet of new orleans which if you've never listened to it is a fantastically musical song by dire straits probably one of the best, best ones it's not one that springs to mind for me, but I must. Yeah, yeah. I must yeah, have, a, have a listen. Yeah, I think. Yeah, if you've got a good stereo as well, it's fantastic on a good stereo. The production on it. Yeah. Anyway, enough about them. Enough about them. Let's get back <laughs> to yourself and uh, let's let's go to a break and play uh, the title track from the album Dangerous Things. You're listening to Expat Radio. You're listening to Expat Radio, beaming out across France and around the world. Hello, this is Mike Madden on The Art Show, and that was Dangerous Things by Simon Mark Smith. We've been talking to Simon about uh, all things musical and particularly about this album. Um... So welcome back, Simon. Uh, and Hi. I think uh, we were talking before the break about physical record and the difference between releasing things on Spotify uh, as compared to the, the 33 and a third or the 45s that, that, that were from my youth, certainly. So do you think in this digital age, do you think we've actually lost something there? Because 
there was a great thrill about picking up your first album or, or the first album that had been released for a while by your favorite band. Uh, and you've got all the lyrics on there and you've got pictures of the band on there. And now you just get a little icon on your computer and, and a, a Spotify download. Yeah. No, I completely agree with you on, on I mean, it's, it's a double sided sword, isn't it? Double edged sword. I mean, um, in a sense that, uh, you know, it's very convenient now to listen to music. I mean, just before I came on, I had a, I was singing an Elvis song to myself, and I thought, oh, I'll have a quick listen to that, and just said to my smart speaker, whose name I won't say, otherwise it'll start talking to me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and uh, you know, I was listening to Elvis playing, you know, I think it was uh, in the ghetto or something like that. And, um, you know, so there is that convenience. And also the, there's the, the portability and the convenience and accessibility to music, but two things uh first of all you don't have that kind of charge but you, you know that kind of joy enjoyment that you were talking about of getting i used to love buying an album and going home and exploring it and listening to it and the cover and reading all the stuff you said was really nice and a lot of people are doing that now aren't they with vinyl yeah but, and but, it's it's the feel of the vinyl as well isn't it and the, the yeah. care you had to take with yeah. it cause you didn't want to scratch it yeah. And also, it in some ways, it does sound nice. There's a kind of a bit... I'm not sure how true this is, but I did play one of my record players the other, you know, the other day, a few months ago, and I did think, oh, it does have a really nice sound to it. But I, it, but it's very inconvenient to be putting records on. You do have to sit down, really, and, and listen to it. Um, so the other thing is, is, is the quality. Of a, of a lot of people are using MP3s now. I suppose a lot of people don't have stereos that are good enough to really show the lack of quality of an MP3. But you do need to listen to something at CD quality or higher. Um, yes, or, yes, to really hear the quality of music. Uh, now, you mentioned Elvis Presley, and I know he was one of your uh, early inspirations. So who else has, has sort of framed your musical career up to now? Uh, well, I think there's so many people. It's funny because I, I think uh, not only is my name sound a bit like Mark Knopfler, Simon Mark Knopfler Smith, I mean, um, but um, I, uh, my voice sounds a bit like him as well. And he, of course, sounded like J.J. Cale and other people a bit like Bob Dylan um, so we're, we're, we're kind of influenced by people but also I probably sound a bit like him because I just naturally sound like him do you see what I mean it's my natural yeah. sound is to be like so I'm not sure if it's so much an influence or well, I did love Dire Straits um, but but just where you are you, where you physically sound in your, in your voice I suppose people can put on voice more um, but I, I love loads of people like Pink Floyd and you know um, loads of heavy I mean um, Thin Lizzy and you know lo loads of people really. Uh, uh, Joan Number Trading, uh, what's her name? Tracy Chapman. Yeah, yeah. Know, Kate Bush. So many people really. I mean, I think when well, we we were, I don't know what decade you were spent most of your time doing with music, but you know the seventies and eighties were so f rich with music. And I think since the nineties, we've hardly had any developments in music, which is odd because we've had so much technology come along, and that used to drive musical styles beforehand you know, with electric guitars or synthesizers. But, you know, the last 20 years, I can't really think of any big developments musically. My decade was absolutely the 70s uh, and 80s. And uh, uh, last week we had Susie Quattro on the show um, and, and she was talking about the, he was also influenced by Elvis Presley. Yeah, I, love, I love Susie Quattro. Yeah. So, so tell, her, tell her I love her. <laughs> I'll send. I used to watch her on Saturday morning TV. I'll, I'll, send, I'll, send you to, I'll send you the link to the interview with Susie. She was a, a wonderful Thank guest. You. Obviously, Elvis has passed away. As of so many other recently, we've lost so many uh, great musicians, people like Prince, David Bowie, Freddie Mercury, people like that. So, yeah. who do you think are going to shape the music of tomorrow? So, you know, if you were if you were sort of twelve or thirteen years old today, who would inspire you musically? Well, I was listening to that. Is it Billy? Billy I can't say. Is it Eilish? Eyelash, anyway. And um, she's quite uh, influential at the moment. I was watching her the other day because they were talking about music production, and you, you can see how you know that. Uh, I mean, and, and she doesn't really. I mean, to me, she's not that distinctive or that different. That's the thing. There's not much at the moment that's really massively different. But obviously, the the big stars like um, people like Adele, they're very influential still. And I mean, there's lots of people around who are still influential. But I can't, I mean, can you think of any musical developments in the last 20 years where, you know, massive new kind of music that came along? No, I think we've we've run into sort of the certain elements of the 70s where music came, became a little bit stale in the mid-70s and that kind of spawned uh, the, the punk and the new wave movement. Whereas in the noughties and the sort of the, the last sort of 10 years or so, we seem to have hit the, a, a block of reality TV musical shows. Yeah, yeah. Which, which which is so contrived that uh, it, it cuts out the hard work of the likes of yourself and, and other musicians. 
the thing is, I mean, um, I mean, I don't really see myself as much of an innovator. I use technology, but there will be people innovating, and the internet does give a lot of accessibility to them, which they'd have never had back in the nineties, you know, they, or before that time. They would have, they would have not got distribution. Um, so there, it's not as if there's not the opportunity really for people to do. It. It's not just that you know the, the Simon Cowles of the world are stopping anybody really. I mean, they've got their area where they're making, you know, they, they do get the, the lion's share. But I actually think there's something else going on at the moment where people are just not, they're not actually being able to find something new. Yeah, yes, I, I know exactly what you mean. Now, as, as you've already mentioned, you, you've got no lower arms, which uh, has certainly not stopped you. Uh, obviously, you you, uh, you do a lot musically, but you're also a digital artist, painter, writer and photographer. So how do you how do you sort of balance all of these things? Uh, I know, for instance, that you've got a degree in fine art. So that would sort of tend towards the artist in you. I think what um, manages it mostly is what I'm getting paid for. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, so if someone wants to, yeah, so if someone wants a photo job done, I'm there with my camera at the ready. And um, and and yesterday I was doing someone's a bit of website work for someone and some photography for them. And so it's really like that. And, and I record other people here in the studio as well. So so so, so that happens. So yeah, really. Uh, um, and at night, I tend to work at night time. I'm very nocturnal. So I tend to do music. So I was up to quite late, about three o'clock this morning, working on a song. I've got I've got two albums already lined up. So it's a lot, you know. It's, uh, so I'm quite prolific musically. But I've got this autobiography I'm working on at the moment, which is on chapter 29, 30 at the moment. And, and, and I've only got to about age five. No, I'm <laughs> a bit older than that. <laughs> I, had a lot, I had a lot of experience at play school. <laughs> so um, that's Susie Quattro, it's her fault. Anyway, uh, but, but so, so yeah, it's quite hard to find this. I mean, also I got quite ill a few years ago. I nearly died. I got sepsis and um, I had burst appendix and a heart condition and was in... Uh, you know, in intensive care, and, and I, I did think time is limited, and it's really important to get things done. And um, you know, so even now, I don't really like wasting time. I, I, I mean, I do. I sit there and watch, binge watch TVs and you know Netflix or whatever. But um, but I am very conscious that things have to get done, be done. Yeah, so. you, you've you've overcome uh, quite a lot of, of difficulties in your life, clearly, and uh, and now you sort of set yourself to different challenges because. We mentioned you've got a degree in fine art. So, do you do your own album artwork as well? Yeah, I do. And and the last one I did when I first did it, the album, the actual printers told me how rubbish it was. So, yeah. uh, so obviously not that good at it when it comes to printing. Um, that's the thing. You do so much stuff on the computer now, you forget kind of how's it going to really look on a print. You know, when printing it up. So uh, yeah, I do all the artwork on there, and uh, it's cheaper that way. Save a bit of money. And I, so. I, I guess with with your hip, the hindrance of having no lower arms, do you need a certain amount of specialised equipment? And, and is it that easy to get hold of? I don't really use any specialised equipment. I don't use any artificial... I, I stopped wearing artificial arms when I was about eight or something, nine. I, I, I like stroking animals and things like that, and you can't really do that with hooks. And I, I think... <laughs> I, I was in care up until about the age of seven, and I remember one day they'd let me go down to the local infant school. I must have been about five. I was in Bernardo's, and... Um, some kids made a little circle around me and took a mick out of me and I just whacked one of them in the head with this artificial <laughs> hook. <you know? laughs> and I was never allowed back to that back to that school again after that. So um yeah, maybe I was maybe they were taken off of me. I was probably a bit dangerous with them. Um but I didn't really like that. I I've got a couple of um straps I put on my arm, which are uh, like if I'm buttering some bread, something like that, I might put a knife up there i mean it's, you know it's a bit slow doing it but i can do that so in in terms of practical things i don't really use many adaptions at all really all right so uh, I, I and then for the computer i actually just type with my paws you know i can manage to do yeah. that so it's funny i used to teach you know in local kind of you know adult education things i could walk into the class and be teaching computers and you could see the look on their face and they'd be going how the hell is he going to teach <laughs> us <laughs> well they get a pleasant surprise no doubt yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's been a great conversation. We're, I'm just getting my eye on the clock. We're running out of time a little bit here. So okay. what, what have you got planned for 2020? We know you've got a, an album out now, but what's 2020 going to bring? Um, we've got, I've got two albums. I'm just going through them, but I'm going to release them kind of 
single by single this summer. I'm doing waiting to do old albums. So that's because of Spotify. So that has changed how I'm working. And so, so there'll be songs coming out every month or so, I imagine, over the next, uh, over the next year and try and get this autobiography done as well. So that's my main things. Also, I'm trying to sell my house and get another house. So that will, that's the thing. Practicalities and housework are the artist's enemies. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. The, 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 the mundane jobs that just won't go away. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it's been a fascinating conversation there, but we are running out of time now. So in, in the minute or so we've got left, just uh, just let our listeners know where they can find out a little bit more about you. Okay, well, my name uh, is Simon Mark Smith on Spotify. I've got a website, simonmarksmith.com. I've got a Facebook page under the same name. It's got one of those blue ticks, so you'll know it's me. And um, I don't use Twitter much, but I'm on there as well if you want to add me on there. So that's really the main thing. Is, is, do you think I've covered everything there? I think you have, yes. Uh... I, thought, I thought you might have fallen asleep by the time I finish <laughs> that long list. <laughs> uh, and, and these days you have to be on every platform don't you so um yeah yeah i mean i'm on all the digital platforms so yeah if you're using deezer or amazon i'll be on there as well right brilliant so i urge our listeners to to check you out it, you've been a wonderful guest thank you so much for coming on thank you mike you're more than welcome and uh, we're going to play out with another song of yours so thank you very much for coming on simon and this is driving me wild You've been listening to the Arts Show podcast with Mike Madden. Come back soon for more artists, authors, musicians and anyone else connected with the arts. We're going to play out with Mike Sanchez and I don't stand a chance.